In the Old Testament, Jesus said, All who hate me love death. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Accepting Him as your Lord and Savior and choosing to follow Him puts you on the way. Obeying the truth of God's Word keeps you on the way, the way that ends in eternal life. Your eternal destiny will be determined by your choices in this world. Steps to Life exists to help people find the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, I want to do something this morning that uh, is uh, completely different from uh, common my common practice here. Uh, as you all know, uh, both the Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter say that there are things in the Bible that are likened to milk, that is spiritual milk, and milk is what you give a baby. Uh, adult mammals, uh, other than human beings, adult mammals don't drink milk. Uh, <coughs> Milk is food for babies, and then <coughs> when the person uh, gets older, they have solid food. And uh, we typically talk about things in our worship service that are on the level of milk because we have people that come here that either are baby Christians or are not Christians yet, or they're just observing, and so we want to, we want to be sure that they have opportunity for salvation. So we talk about more difficult subjects, almost always, more difficult subject than our preaching and revival service. But today, uh, I am going to begin to talk about a very difficult subject. So you need to pray for me that I won't uh, make a misstatement or state something too strongly. It is a very difficult subject. It is a subject that in my observation, there are very few professional people, highly educated people, that understand. Uh, and so you might say, well, then why should we study it? Nobody can understand why should we study it. Well, I think that you'll see by the end why we need to study it. It's a subject that has to do with some people right in our audience right here. and. Uh, I have, don't usually give titles to sermons at the beginning either, but I'm going to do that today. The title of what I'm going to study with you is just one word. And that one word is expediency. Expediency. And like I say, this is a very difficult subject to talk about. Although I have studied this subject myself and thought a great deal about it for over 50 years. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to study. I don't know if that I've ever preached about it before. So please pray for me that the Lord will help me not to say anything too strong. And uh, let's pray before we begin to study God's Word together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your house at this time and to study your holy book. And we earnestly pray that your spirit will enlighten the eyes of our understanding as we study, that we might understand what you are trying to teach us, that we might become wise in spiritual things, and that we may not lose our faith when we are tested. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Expediency is a big word that we don't use in everyday speech always. So let me just give you, first of all, uh, the, the definition of the word expediency from Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. They say that it's a makeshift or means devised or employed in an exigency. Well, now that really is enlightening, isn't it? Uh, what's an exigency? Well, they say what that is, too. That is something that is urgent it's a situation that demands immediate action. So, it's a makeshift or a device, a means devised to be employed in some urgent emergency type of a situation. Now, as we're going to see in a little bit, these, quote, emergency situations, these urgency situations can go on for hundreds and, in some cases, thousands of years. Here's the way um, the American Heritage Dictionary 
defines the word expediency. They say it's something that is a means to an end, a contrivance adopted to meet an urgent need marked by concern for policy rather than principle. And as you no doubt have guessed already, working on the basis of expediency can be extremely dangerous. Let me read... Uh, this is a word that is only used probably a couple of times in the spirit of prophecy. Let me read you one statement where Ellen White uses the word expediency. This is what she says about it. God has given men reason, and the noblest use to which the intellectual faculties can be put is the study of his word. And when through diligent and prayerful application the will of God has been discerned, nothing should be allowed to come in between God and the soul to swerve it from the path of strict obedience. Here's the word. No suggestions of propriety, no motives of expediency, no selfish desire for gain, no fear of loss, dishonor, or reproach should be considered for a moment. God commands, and that is enough. The light shines, and it is our duty to walk in it. If men substitute human customs and traditions for the precepts of God's law and proclaim to the world that that law or any part of that law is no longer in force. However honest they may be, they are under the condemnation of the law and will perish as transgressors. So, expediency is dangerous. You can lose your soul over practicing expediency. Now the problem comes in when what seems to be expedient or necessary involves sin. And that brings me to another absolutely thorny question. And the question is, is there such a thing as a necessary evil or a necessary sin? In my experience with people that are highly educated, I have found that, well, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody that's highly educated that believes this among Adventists. What they believe, now, if you don't believe that, you're forced to believe something else. And what highly educated people believe, almost without exception, is they believe situation ethics. Now, they'll tell you that they don't, but they actually do. I remember I used to be on the faculty of Southwestern Adventist College, and one time I was assigned, different faculty members were assigned different adjunct responsibilities during the school year, and there was a time for a year or two, I was assigned to be on the discipline committee. And let me tell you, no faculty member wants to be on the discipline committee. But I was assigned to the discipline committee, so I was on the discipline committee, and I remember saying to myself, after the close of two or three hour meetings, I said to myself, if we did not believe in situation ethics, we could have solved all our problems in about five minutes. But we do. Almost all highly educated people believe in situation ethics. Almost all ministers, almost all physicians, almost all lawyers, judges. And we, by believing in situation ethics, if you believe that, then you don't have to believe that there's any necessary evil. And, of course, those of us that believe that there is such a thing as necessary evil, we're thought of as sort of crackpots or extremists or people that just don't know. Is some, let me ask you this question. Is, if something is evil, is it sin? That should not be a hard question for you to answer if you've looked up the definition of evil in the dictionary. Something that is evil. The dictionary says that something that is evil is something that is immoral or morally wrong. That's what the dictionary says evil is. So if it's immoral, that means it's contrary to the moral law. It's contrary to the Ten Commandments. So if something is evil, it is sin. So then, is there such a thing? as a necessary sin? Well, let's go to the Bible first of all and see what we can find out. Now as I've studied my Bible, I found out, I first started studying this when I was a freshman in college. 
I started posing questions to the most experienced Adventist ministers that I knew. None of them had good answers. I have found that this, we're going to look at the book of Isaiah. When I was a freshman in college, I, in my devotional life, I made a study of the whole book of Isaiah. And in my study of the book of Isaiah, I ran across this text. And I asked ministers about it. They could not answer. They could not give me a good answer. Now, the Bible translators even had trouble with it. And so what we've done, if you have a modern translation, we have toned it down. <laughs> we've taken the word evil out of the text, which was in the Old King James Version, and we've substituted the word calamity or something that doesn't put the Lord, doesn't put God in such a bad light. Turn your Bible, first of all, to Isaiah 45. And verse 7, it says in verse, the last part of verse 6, I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create, what does it say in your Bible? Now, I'm hearing more than one thing. Some of your Bibles say something like calamity. And others of you, if you have the Old King James Version, it says evil. The, word, the Hebrew word is raw, and it simply means evil. That's what it means, something that's really bad. Somebody says, well, God couldn't create something like that. He does. That's what the Bible says. I decided a long time ago I was not going to argue with the Bible. The Lord says, I create evil. Even the Bible translators couldn't get around that in their minds. So they said, we're going to put another word in that doesn't sound quite so bad, but a calamity, something else. Here's one more text. Look in uh, the book of Amos. The third chapter. Now, the Bible translator did the same thing in this verse, too. It's the same word, evil. They said, you know, the Lord, we can't accuse the Lord of something like that. So they put in the word, in mine, it says calamity. It says, if a trumpet is blown in, the ci in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there's a calamity, that's evil in the city, will not the Lord have done it? Now, these are very hard texts. I told you we're going to study a hard subject today. These are very hard texts. When I was a freshman in college and started asking minister Adventist ministers, experienced, well-known Adventist ministers about these texts, they could not give me a good, good answer. I want to read to you a statement from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 59. By the way, we're just, this is just an introductory sermon. We're going to really get into this subject someday when probably there's just a few people around and it's a little safer to talk. We're going to get in deep to it. We'll just introduce it now. And this will be hard enough. Patriarchs of Prophets, page 59, this is what it says. It was not the will of God that the sinless pair should know aught of evil. He had freely given them the good and had withheld the evil. It wasn't God's will that you should know anything about evil. If, you had, if the human race had never learned anything about evil, you wouldn't know, you, you wouldn't he ever hear about an accident because the angels don't have accidents. You would never hear of somebody that was sick or was in pain. Oh, that's a result of evil. And God did not, it wasn't His will that we should know anything about that. And, by the way, does, does that help you to understand that if God doesn't want you to have something or know about something, it's better for you not to have it, better not to know it? Does that make sense to you when you think about it? It says, He had freely given them the good and withheld the evil, but contrary to His command, they had eaten of the forbidden tree, and now they would continue to eat of it. They would continue to eat of this tree. Not only them, every one of their descendants would eat of this tree. Nobody's excluded. We've all eaten of it. Now they would continue to eat of it. They would have the knowledge of evil, that sin, all the days of their life.
So when we're, when we're going to start studying now about expediency, expediency is when something is sinful, it's evil. But because of the circumstances of society, people believe that it is necessary. So some people say, well, in that situation, it's all right. A few of us say, no, it's still evil. Even though it's necessary, it's still evil. And as some of you are going to be surprised to learn in a few minutes, in dealing with the sin problem, sometimes God authorizes his prophets to allow sin to develop even among his chosen people for a time. So, let's get right into the subject. Let's look at some examples in the Bible. Open your Bible, please to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, verses 1 to 3. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Notice what was going on. They began to practice polygamy, and when they were practicing polygamy, the Holy Spirit was speaking to their conscience, saying, Don't do that. They knew it was wrong. How did they know it was wrong? Because at the beginning, God had given to Adam how many wives? One. They knew it was wrong, and the Holy Sp when you know something is wrong and you start to do something that's wrong, the Holy if you haven't committed the unpardonable sin, the Holy Spirit speaks to your conscience, convicts your conscience. That's wrong. Don't do it. That's wrong. Don't do it. That's wrong. Don't do it. But they did it anyway. And the Lord said, my, my Spirit's not going to keep striving with them forever. Polygamy was one of the major reasons uh, that the world was destroyed by a flood. But even though it was one of the major reasons that the world was destroyed by a flood, after the flood, it became commonplace again. It became so common that in Abraham's time, it wasn't even thought it was wrong. One of the most painful things that I had to learn growing up was that if everybody is doing something, people don't recognize it's wrong anymore. I'll give you a quick modern example. I was attending a meeting. Uh, a gentleman approximately my same age was speaking at, at this meeting. And he was saying, he said, when we were young, if you wanted to live with somebody, you got married first. He says, they don't think that's necessary anymore. Why don't they? Because so many people are doing it that people's conception of right and wrong has gotten fuzzy because of what's going on all around. Now let me ask you a quick question. Is polygamy a sin? Uh-huh. Polygamy is a sin. Well, let's read a few Bible texts. Now I want you to see, first of all, Abraham practiced polygamy. And I'm not talking about Hagar either. Look in Genesis 25. Polygamy is one of the sins that r resulted in the flood, and yet even Abraham practiced polygamy. How do you explain that? Look in Genesis 25. It says, Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had while he was still living. Abraham practiced polygamy. Polygamy was allowed under the Old Covenant. Do you want me to read that to you? Look in Exodus 21. This is an amazing scripture. I studied this one out when I was about 19 years old. 
I didn't like it then, I still don't like it now, but it's in the Bible. And Exodus 21 is talking about a man who had taken a slave girl as his wife, and then it says in verse 10, if he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food or clothing and her marriage rights. Notice, under the Old Covenant, polygamy was allowed, even though that was a sin that brought on the flood. Astonishing. Look, for example, in Deuteronomy 21. Starting with verse 15. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved, and if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons that he must not bestow firstborn status, the firstborn received twice as much of the inheritance as the others, he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved, who is truly the firstborn, but he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Notice, polygamy is allowed, period. And have you ever asked your question, self the question, do you think that because of expediency, do you think that there were any women that lived in those days that were tempted to lose faith in God, lose faith in His people, lose faith in the Bible, lose faith in the prophets, lose faith in everything because of what they're going through? Do you think there are any people like that? There would have been many, many. Let's look at just one. Turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel the first chapter, verses 1 and 2. There was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. Why did he have two wives? Because he married a wife, and she didn't have any children. And there were, the law of the lands in those days were... If your wife did not, they wanted to preserve their family name. If your wife did not bear you any children, you were, we've, the archaeologists have dug up huge tons of evidence to prove this. You were allowed, it was right in the marriage contract that if your wife did not bear you any children, you could marry another wife. You could get a second wife so that you could get children and preserve your family name. And that's what Elkanah did. Hannah didn't have any children. So he married another wife. So he could have children. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Was that wrong? Was that wrong of Elkanah to do that? Was that sinful of Elkanah to do that? We won't even get into situations with David and Solomon and Abigail and Bathsheba and a whole bunch of other people. It was sinful, and the leaders among God's people were doing it. And let me tell you, if you're on the receiving end of expediency, it is hard to take. And people, one of the reasons we need to study this, people that are on the receiving end of expediency... They're tempted to give up faith in God and the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy, in the church, everything. How long did this go on, by the way? After it was it was in existence at Moses' time. We just read it in Exodus twenty one, Deuteronomy. How long did it go on? It went on for fifteen hundred years. It was not corrected in the Bible that I know of until New Testament times. I don't know of any place where Jesus actually spoke about it, but the Apostle Paul, and the, other, the Apostle Paul especially, he corrected it. 
let's see what the Apostle Paul wrote. He, it was time this expediency had to be corrected. All expediency is temporary. That's something you need to remember, especially if you're on the receiving end of it. All expediency is temporary. There's coming a time when it's all going to be over. It's not going to be anymore. And the Apostle Paul credited it. Look in your Bible in Ephesians 5. Verse 31. Now, in this verse, the Apostle Paul is quoting from Genesis 2.24. But, because of the practice of polygamy, men thought, well, I could be one flesh with this woman and this woman and this woman. Paul says, no, that's not true. And so the Apostle Paul added a word that's not in Genesis 2.24. He quoted, he's quoting Genesis 2.24, but he added a word so that nobody could make a mistake. And the word he added is spelled in English T-W-O. That's an added word. That's not, you look in your Bible in Genesis, that word's not in Genesis. And here's what he says in Ephesians 5.31. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Notice the Apostle Paul does not say they three, they four, they six. He says how many? Two. The whole concept of polygamy is done away with, with this pronouncement. Not only that, but when the Apostle Paul, you can, we're not going to take up the time to, to look it up in 1 Timothy 3. When the Apostle Paul was giving instructions to young ministers about ordaining elders and deacons in the church, he said, look, by the way, in the Apostle Paul's time, polygamy was still practiced all over the eastern part of the Roman Empire. The Apostle Paul says, we, we are not going to have any deacons or elders in the Christian church who have more than one wife. And so he told Timothy, he said, when you, if you're going to ordain somebody as a bishop, an elder, or as a deacon, they can only be the husband of one wife. That's what he was telling him. He was not telling him, like some people have terribly misconstrued his words, to say that you have to be a man who is the husband of one wife to be a deacon or an elder. That, that's nonsense. That's not what he was talking about. My son was an elder in the largest church in the Southwestern Union when he wasn't married to anybody. That wasn't wrong. When a minister's wife dies, we don't take his credentials away and say, you can't be an elder anymore because you're not married to one wife. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. Paul wasn't married to one wife either. Neither was Barnabas. That's not what he was talking about. What he was saying was, you cannot be an elder or a deacon in the Christian church and be married to more than one wife. You don't have to be married, but you can't be married to more than one wife and be a deacon or an elder in the Christian church. That's what Paul was teaching in 1 Timothy 3. So this problem of polygamy went on. By the way, we're, we're going to run out of time. I don't have time to explain to you the rationale behind polygamy. My brother Marshall and I used to talk about it. The rationale why they believed that they had to do it. That, you can study that on your own. If you don't understand it, it won't, won't hurt you. They had a rationale. They thought that in the situation they were in, they needed to do it. Paul said, no, that isn't the way it was at the beginning. So after 1,500 years, this expediency was wiped out. Let's look at another one. Here's a second example in the Bible. Turn your Bible to Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. It says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back. By the way, listen carefully. There are Adventists that are not in harmony with this. This is plain. Then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that, that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Have you ever wondered 
Why did Moses ever give them permission to do something like this? Why? Is, is Devoris evil? Is Devoris sinful? Well, let me read to you another scripture about Devoris and see what you think about it. After I read one more scripture. Turn your Bible to the book of Malachi. Chapter 2, starting with verse 13. And this is the second thing you do. This is Malachi 2.13. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore he take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. When I was young, still a teenager, in my early 20s, one of the things that I studied out from inspired writings, I wanted to find out from inspired writings, what things does God hate? And the reason I wanted to find that out was because I decided that I did not want to be involved in doing something that God hates. How about you? It's amazing to me how bold human beings are to do something that inspired writings say that God hates. Divorce is one of the things that God hates. You see that there? You want to do something that God hates? Well, why were they allowed to do this? That's something for you to study out for expediency. In other words, you're allowing a lesser evil in order to attempt to prevent a greater evil. You're allowing a lesser sin to avoid, try to avoid a greater sin. How long did this go on? It went on for 1,500 years after Moses' time. It wasn't corrected until Jesus came, and Jesus did correct it. They tried to get him in trouble for correcting it because they said, oh, they said, this is what the leaders, they said, you're not, you're not teaching according to the law of Moses. Look it up in your Bible in Matthew 19. Here's what it says in Matthew 19. Starting with verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? That was one of their debates. What was just basis for divorce and what wasn't? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Hey, let's stop right there for just a moment, see if you've thought this through. We have people in our society today They're not going to marry more than one wife, or a woman's not going to marry more than one husband. But they say, I don't need to marry somebody the opposite sex. I'll get married to somebody the same sex as myself. And this has gotten so, so bad in the United States, we're even taking it to the Supreme Court to try to sort it out. Let me ask you a question. At the beginning, did, could Adam practice homosexuality? No, because there was only created one man and one woman. There's only created one man and one woman. Adam could not practice homosexuality. He could not marry somebody like himself. Could Eve be a lesbian in the Garden of Eden? No. There wasn't any other woman there. God did not create two men. He did not create two women. He did not create multiple women for Adam. He did not create multiple men for Eve. He created one man and one woman. Adam only had one wife and Eve only had one husband. 
Actually, our society today could learn a great deal from studying the Garden of Eden if we would just study it. Just read Genesis 2. You could learn a lot that a lot of people today don't know. And Jesus pointed people back to the beginning. He said, at the beginning he made a male and a female. And then he said in verse 3, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Notice, Jesus also added the word to here. It's not in the Genesis 2.24. He's quoting from Genesis 2.24. He has the word to. People were confused in those days. Verse 6. So then they are long, no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So now comes the objections. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? If it's wrong, if it's bad, why did Moses tell us to do it? We could do it. Are there things in inspired writings that were, are there because of expediency? Exactly there are. You're allowing an evil to an attempt to avoid an even greater evil. It's expediency. It's not what God wanted. It's not His will. It's not good. It's evil. This polygamy was evil. This divorce was evil. It was sinful. It was wrong. But it was allowed. In our prayer meeting, by the way, we have been reading from the book Prophets and Kings. I was very interested. Some weeks ago, I just pondered it for days after we read the statement in prayer meeting. It's talking about Isaiah. And it says, his mission was not to be wholly fruitless, yet the evils that had been multiplying for many generations could not be removed in his day. Very interesting. The evils, is something evil sin? Yes, it is. These sins that have been accumulating in the land of Israel for many generations, they couldn't be removed. Well, if they can't be removed, then what are you doing? You're tolerating them. Some people lose all faith in God and the Bible and his people when something like that happens. Now, we are rapidly running out of time, and I want to give you one more example from the Bible of expediency. Remember, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're on the receiving end of, ex of expediency, it's temporary. There's coming a time when the Lord's going to deliver you from all that. But in this world, the expediency can go on for a very long time, if you as you've just seen in the first two examples we looked at. Now we're going to look at one more example. Now the first examples that we looked at are pretty easy for preachers in America to talk about because, you know, we don't believe, we don't believe in polygamy, and theoretically, we don't believe in divorce, even though it goes on all the time, even in the church. But we're going to get now into some really, really sensitive material that preachers can get into a lot of trouble talking about. And it has to do with expediency. Clear back in Old Testament times, and I... I could take the time to go back in the writings of Moses and read you, read you from the Old Covenant again, Exodus 21. We could read several other places in the Old Testament. But it, 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 this one now didn't, didn't go just into Old Testament times. This one went into the New Testament times, and it went after New Testament times, and it came to America, and it, we're still having the results, but now. And... That was the practice they developed where rich people would actually buy poor people and then those poor people would be indentured servants. We call them slaves, bondmen, slaves. I want to read you a statement about expediency in regard to slavery. 
This is from the book Acts of the Apostles, page 459 and 460. It was not the Apostles' work, that's the Apostle Paul, to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. Remember, in the Roman Empire, approximately two-thirds of the population were slaves, only one-third were free. It was not the Apostles' work to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. To attempt this would be to prevent the success of the gospel, but he taught principles which struck at the very foundation of slavery and which, if carried into effect, would surely undermine the whole system. That's what the gospel always does. If you accept the gospel, does it undermine the whole system of polygamy? It undermines the whole system. If you accept the gospel and you completely... Does it undermine the whole practice all over the world today of getting divorces? Does it undermine that? Yes, it does. And if you accept the gospel, it undermines the whole philosophy, the foundational framework of slavery. It undermines the whole thing. And that's why Jesus begins at the heart. If you are ever going to eventually get rid of all these expedient things you have to get the heart changed first. If you don't get the heart changed first, you're not going to solve the problem, whether it's polygamy or divorce or slavery or anything else, you're not going to solve the problem if you don't get the heart of people changed. And my dear friend, if our hearts are not changed, we'll never be in the kingdom of heaven, even if we have all the right theology. The Pharisees had the right theology but their hearts weren't changed. And Jesus told Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, he said, unless you're born again, there is no chance for you. Because the Apostle Paul said, where the Spirit of the Lord is. This was, by the way, one of the favorite texts of early Americans. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's totally contrary. That's 2 Corinthians 3.17. That's totally contrary to the practice of slavery. I was very interested several weeks ago when my wife Elva and I were on the East Coast and we went through Monticello to find out Thomas Jefferson had slaves and he knew that it was wrong. He was still operating on expediency. He didn't know how to get out of the situation. Ellen White writes, when converted, the slave became a member of the body of Christ, and as such was to be loved and treated as a brother, a fellow heir with his master, to the blessings of God and the privileges of the gospel. We read about that in our scripture lesson today, scripture reading today in Ephesians 6. One time there was a, by the way, in the Christian churches in the first century, there were people in the church who had slaves, and some of their slaves became Christians. So you had the, the owners of the slaves and the slaves. Now, they didn't really own them. Nobody really owns a slave. That's, you can only own another person by usurpation. But the masters and the servants were in the same church. And one of these Christians who had slaves was a man by the name of Philemon. And his slave had stolen from him and then escaped. And he escaped and he went to Rome and he, this slave Onesimus got acquainted with the Apostle Paul and he became a Christian and they talked things over and see Onesimus had wronged his master. Now it wasn't right for his master to consider him a slave but it wasn't right for him to do what he had done either. And if you want to be in the kingdom of heaven the Apostle Paul taught that you should make things right. And so Onesimus decided all oh, Whatever happens, I don't know what's going to happen to me because I know he's furious with me, and he was. Ellen White says he was, that Philemon was furious with what Onesimus had done. He says, what, no matter what happens to me, I have to make things right. And so the Apostle Paul said, well, let me write an introductory letter for you. Now, this letter is in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul said, let me write an introductory letter for you to, to give to Philemon. So if you turn in your Bible cl close to the end of the New Testament, here is the letter to Philemon, slave owner, Christian. 
How could anybody be a Christian and be a slave owner? Well, I don't know. I can't explain it. He just hadn't totally understood the principles of the gospel yet. Notice what the Apostle Paul says about his slave to Philemon. Look in Philemon, verse 16. We'll just read that for lack of time. You can study the whole letter later today. It's short. It says, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a what? A beloved brother. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him the same way you'd receive me. Expediency. This problem of slavery went on after New Testament times until it entered the United States. And in the United States, it took over a hundred years, or most of a hundred years after it became a nation, before Abraham Lincoln finally signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But after the Civil War was over, there was so much racial hatred that there were lynchings in various parts of the South. It happened many times, and it was dangerous for a black person to even attempt social activities with white people. And this situation continued in an extreme way until in 1956, President Dwight Eisenhower sent federal troops down to Little Rock, Arkansas, and he said, we're not going to have this in this country anymore. And that was followed up later in 1964. We passed a civil rights law, which has changed the whole country. People that weren't, that weren't alive before then cannot comprehend, like the rest of us can, how much difference there is in the country today than there was before 1964. Now, after the Civil War, though, when there was so much hatred against people who had formerly been slaves, there were many people, including Christians, that decided we needed to be segregated. I understand about segregation. When I was a small child, my parents moved to Tennessee near Nashville. I know what it's like to go to a church where there's millions of black people all over, but there's not one in the church. The church is only for white people. The sanitarium is only for white patients. The school is only for white students. I've been there. I know about it. it was, this was Adventist institutions, by the way. There was a black preacher during those times that made this statement one time. He said, the color of your skin or the kink in your hair will not be counted against you if you have overcome. The Lord's table will not be a table out in the kitchen or down in the cellar. You will sit if you are faithful with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, for you have the same faith as they. Adventists took a long time to try to learn this. We actually, we were forced into it eventually by the United States government. Not because we voluntarily chose to do what was right. In fact, in 1889, we had a prominent Seventh-day Adventist minister. His name was Kilgore. And he got up in the 1889 General Conference and he said, we need to be segregated. We need to have a color line. Black people over here, white people over here. Before 1956, that was commonplace all over the South. When he proposed this color line policy, in 1891, Ellen White made a very sharp rebuke to this idea of having a color line. I want to read to you several, in closing several things Ellen White said about this in 1891. She said, While at St. Louis a year ago, as I knelt in prayer, these words were presented to me as if written with a pen of fire. All ye are brethren. That's Matthew 23. That's what Jesus said. The Spirit of God rested upon me in a wonderful manner, and matters were open to me in regard to the church at St. Louis and in other places. The spirit and words of some in regard to members of the church were an offense to God. There are colored people who are true and faithful, precious in the sight of God of heaven, and they should have just as much respect as any of God's children. Those who have spoken harshly to them or have despised them have despised the purchase of the blood of Christ. She goes on to say, 
that when you become a Christian, you become part of one family. And she says, the black man's name is written in the book of life beside the white man's. She says that many who claim to be children of God are actually children of the devil. She says, if a colored brother sits by your side, you should not be offended or despise him. And she said, we ha you have no license from God to exclude the colored people from your places of worship. Treat them as Christ's property, which they are just as much as yourselves. They should hold membership in the church with the white brethren. That's what Ellen White said in 1891. Would that we would have been able to follow that. But you know what? Because of the racial t hatreds and the racial tensions, our problems became so severe. James S. N. White wrote to his mother when she was in Australia describing what was happening, and Ellen White decided that. Did you know that prophets sometimes have to reverse themselves for reasons of expediency? Did you know that? I told you this is a hard subject. I want to read to you something from Volume 9 that Ellen White wrote, page 206, directly contradictory to what she wrote in 1891. She said, in regard to white and colored people worshiping in the same building, this cannot be followed as a general custom with profit to either party, especially in the South. The best thing will be to provide the colored people with, who accept the truth with places of worship of their own, in which they can carry on their services by themselves. I don't have time to read it, but in that very same article, she said, in the future, this is going to be done away. She spelled it out. She said that when the loud cry would come, all this business of segregation and all this racial, it's going to stop because when you're really converted, you're not going to have those kind of feelings anymore. You're not going to have that anymore. Now, in closing... I want to run by you two things very, very quickly. And if the Lord wills for me to preach on this subject again to a very small group of people, selected people, uh, who are getting into some hard, really hard things, I'll go into more depth on this. But I'm mentioning two things quickly in closing. Number one, there are two groups. If you are one of the people who are on the receiving end of expediency, it is very easy for people to lose faith in God, the Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy. Do you suppose that Hannah ever had that kind of a temptation? Do you suppose that Hagar ever had that kind of temptation? Do you suppose that Bathsheba ever had that kind of temptation? Yes. But remember, expediency, if you're on the receiving end of it, it's temporary if you're one of God's children. It is going to be done away. But the second thing we need to look at very quickly. In the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. That's Proverbs, I think it's page about 678 or so. In commenting on this situation, Ellen White said very plainly to the Seventh-day Adventists at that time, we are not ready for the Lord to come. They weren't. The Lord couldn't come in that generation. The Lord can't come people living like that, practicing like that, believing like that. That is contrary to the gospel. Now, my time's more than enough. I'll tell you this very quickly. You can, you can study it out and you can tell me if you disagree, and you're free to disagree. It is my belief, it is my conviction, and this has been my conviction for many years. It is my belief that there is going to be a group of people called the 144,000 in the last days who will be translated to heaven that will be totally free from all matters of expediency when Jesus comes. That is my belief. Now, my dear friends, we are not free from it yet. It is all through Adventism. Now, I've given you three examples. Don't think that those are the only three that could be given. It'd be easy to give a dozen. I just gave three. Would you like to be ready for Jesus to come? If you want to be ready for Jesus to come, is it appropriate for me to pray and say, Lord, what is it in my thought process that needs to be totally changed so that I can be in harmony? with Jesus Christ so that I can think the way he thinks about things, so I can feel the way he feels about things. Is that the change that you want? We have no idea, friends. I'm convicted of this. We have no idea how much we need to be changed inside, be ready for Jesus to come. We're not ready. 
Let's pray that the Lord will help us to get ready. If you're willing, let's kneel down and let's talk to the Lord about it now. Father in heaven, we cannot comprehend your forbearance with the awful things that we as humans do, claiming that it's necessary and there's no other way out. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts and help us to see that there is a different way of thinking. There is a different way of feeling. There is a different way of acting than we act down here. Help us to understand the relationship that we really should have with each other. The relationship we should have with your people and the relationship that we have to those who are outside the fold of faith. Lord, we pray that you would deliver us from the expediencies that are practiced all around us. Help us to get our focus on our Master, on our Savior, on his character, and that we might become like him. And help us to find out what it really means when Jesus said, All of you are brothers. Oh, Lord, some way, help us to get it figured out. By your grace, by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782828, Wichita, Kansas, 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.